This is Global Humanist Shop Talk. I'm M.L. Clark. Do you remember your first exposure to nationalism? It's a big concept, incredibly abstract, but it first enters our lives in much more concrete ways, for better and for worse. For folks in the West, it might be our first memory of a giant slab cake cut into pieces and distributed at a local gathering in the park before fireworks fill the sky. Or maybe it's an anthem sung at sporting events or in school or at scouts meetings. It might be a flag draped over a neighbor's house or wrapped around the shopping cart of a person living in the street. It might be images on the coins and bills you use to learn math or distorted maps of the world with clean, uncomplicated borders pinned to your classroom wall. It might be the poems you're made to memorize, the books and films you're made to read and watch so that you too can stand at attention while a bugle plays its mournful notes and shed tears for people who died long before you were born in wars you're told gave you or protected your freedom. It might also be other stories you're given about famous people you've never met, tales of invention and discovery that invite you to imagine that you were part of the ancient act, that this is your inheritance. We invented this. Our people discovered that. No child is born with a national anthem on their lips, and the geographical or ethnic idea of a nation also takes time for a small human being to incorporate into their sense of the world. And if one's national identity comes from a physical landscape different from the one that they currently occupy, if one belongs to a heritage or an immigrant story that involves multiple nations, past and present? Then the story for a small child to learn becomes even more complicated. Here is where bigger stories of family origin appear. Here is where we learn about ongoing demographic conflicts, unhealed wounds between your community and another. Here too is where grand stories of a shared cultural destiny might also appear. And of course, when we move beyond the safety and security of many, but not all, Western childhoods, we quickly encounter more extreme introductions to national identity. In far too many parts of the world, children awaken very young to the understanding that they belong to a particular state or ethnicity from the blunt and brutal exposure to the idea that someone wants them dead for this same reason that someone is waging a violent war upon them, raining hellfire from above or pouring murder through their streets because their national identities differ. I must be X because Y sees me as X. And when Y kills me for being X, Y will claim victory for Y over X. Therefore, in the name of X, I must fight Y and maybe even kill Y so that X may have victory instead. All this early coding for nationalism happens when we are too young to develop careful, informed opinions about our social contracts. This coding for pride, for belonging, for geographic and ethnic division is deeply emotional, familial, and tribal. And the more we act within these contracts, the more often we become defensive of them. For instance, if we were ever proud of our founding fathers, only to learn that some of them kept and deeply abused slaves or aggressively sought the extermination of indigenous peoples, an open desire to dismantle monuments to that rose-tinted past we were raised to adore can easily feel like an attempt to dismantle us, to suggest that we should go around wearing hair shirts, flagellating ourselves for the crime of being inheritors to a criminal terrain. Likewise, if one chooses to serve in the military, and there are so many reasons a person might choose to serve, not least of which being that the military is often the only path out of socioeconomic hardship, 
then a person criticizing the very concept of nationalism is probably going to cut deep, to feel like an attack on the value of the time you gave up, the trauma you incurred, the ideals for which you fought and your friends maybe died. We are not well prepared as a species to detach the abstract from the personal. Human behavior resists our best attempts to rise out of early conditioning and to find a compassionate but firm path out of ongoing complicity in unjust systems. And yet, the actual foundation story for most nations shares very little with most of the cultural touchstones that train us up in our national identities. And we could very easily go our entire lives not realizing how much our approaches to policy have been shaped by distorted initial premises. But especially now, especially as the world finds itself facing a significant number of global challenges that require thinking beyond the traditional nation state, we would do very well indeed to interrogate some of the foundational assumptions on which our nationalism lies. That's why for this and the next five episodes of Global Humanist Shop Talk, for our first of three miniseries in season two, we're going to be exploring the traditional nation state in a way that questions what really makes this organizational framework for society so different from, say, that of a corporation. And to be clear, this is not a game of semantics that we'll be playing, but rather an attempt to look past the emotional fog of nationalist thinking, which has done such a good job of training us into seeing nation-state projects in a very different light. At present, we're fully aware that corporate monopolies have negatively contributed to our current climate change crisis and have other far-reaching consequences for global politics, scientific research, and technological investment. All of these are serious problems for the maintenance and improvement of our democracies, but so too is the rhetoric we use around our struggle for improved human agency. Rhetoric that currently imagines that business and the state are distinct enterprises. But when seen through a more detached lens, what if that history of our nation states tells us something very different about the organizational principles of modern society? And what if acknowledging that other, deeper story of human institutions could give us the tools to build up something better? After all, it's that mental flip, that moment when we better understand how agency can be enhanced or lessened by our policies and cultures, which this humanist podcast always sets out to explore, one everyday object or concept at a time. You're listening to Global Humanist Shop Talk, and for six episodes, we're extracting a deeper understanding of contemporary global politics through a study of petro-nationalism, the formation, maintenance, and advancement of countries through the oil and gas industries they have created, traded in, and otherwise leveraged for international power at cost to the humans in the mall. There's another way that children in the West are trained up in nationalism, which is as good a starting point as any for rethinking our foundational premises about the nation state as an organizing concept. My Führer, Kameraden, Deutsche, Männer und Frauen. It's possible that you were expressly taught the Westphalian system in school, but if the name doesn't ring a bell, don't worry. Generally, middle school and high school students are introduced to the concept through that most sensational tale of its collapse, the lead up to World War I. You all know the story, of course. The way most of us are taught it, European countries had sustained a careful balance of power between empires for decades. How is this balance maintained? in two related ways. First, through a kind of mutually assured destruction in the form of treaties that promised multinational response if one country went to war. 
the idea was that these treaties would serve as a strong disincentive for any one country to get the ball rolling on undermining the sovereignty of another. And to add extra weight to that threat, at the turn of the 20th century, European countries were also keeping their militaries and navies as robust and up-to-date as possible. Surely no one would risk full-on confrontation when the odds weren't clearly in their favor. Well, that worked until the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir apparent to the Austrian throne in Sarajevo on June 28, 1914, by a Bosnian Serb. It wasn't just that his murder led Austria-Hungary to issue what's called the July Ultimatum, a series of demands on Serbian government that the latter answered in part by mobilizing its troops. It's also that Ferdinand himself had been a stabilizing diplomatic force. With him out of the picture, it was much more difficult for remaining power brokers in the region to peacefully resolve escalating tensions. And so, Serbia, having confirmed that it had Russia's support, amassed its own troops while responding in half measures to Austria-Hungary's demands. And when word reached Austria-Hungary's emperor about a possible skirmish between Serbian and Austrian military, he declared war. That action immediately compelled France and Russia to mobilize their troops under a treaty that required shows of military force from them both the moment that anyone from an opposing force, the Triple Alliance of Austria-Hungary, Germany, or Italy, went to war. And did Germany feel comfortable with Russian troops forming near its borders? Of course not. So after a heated exchange between Russia and Germany's leaders, known as the Vili Niki letters because the two leaders were related, Germany fully mobilized too. What we now call World War I and what was then called the Great War ensued. The balance of power had fallen apart and it had taken with it all hope of retaining the traditional system of nation states the Westphalian system, though many would try to resurrect facets of it in the years to come. I am as anxious as any human being can be to have the United States render every possible service to the civilization and the peace of mankind. But I am certain that we can do it best by not putting ourselves in leading strings or subjecting our policies and our sovereignty to other nations. The independence of the United States. But let's take a beat and rethink this series of events with all the nationalist assumptions built into them. In this story of World War I, we're supposed to take for granted that there was a balance of power and that there was an active, coherent application of the Westphalian system of nation states right up until one fateful day in June of 1914. And yet, the evidence against that claim, that set of causal factors used to teach 20th century history in much of Europe and North America, is right in the location of Archduke Ferdinand's assassination, Sarajevo. Where was Sarajevo exactly? In what country that Austria-Hungary thought itself entitled to make demands on Serbia right after Ferdinand's murder? Before I answer that question, let's clear up this mystery term, the Westphalian system. It gets its name from the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, a series of diplomatic actions that ended a 30 years war and also an 80 years war to launch a key turning point in the development of secular society. But war between which powers exactly? Well, that was the question, because before this critical moment in the history of peacekeeping and the modern nation state, monarchical relationships with local territory and a much more complicated and diffuse notion of religious mandate had come to a breaking point in the kingdom of Bohemia. European history is messy, but I'll try to keep this brief. We're often taught that the Roman Empire was an ancient society, but not only did the Eastern Roman Empire continue until the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire in 1453, but a later version of the Western structure persisted in the form of the Holy Roman Empire, which had the strong support of the Roman Catholic Church, which endorsed it as a continuation of traditional Roman Emperor lineage. 
In practice, this meant that the empire's ideas of rulership were tied into religious formations of manifest destiny long before that term would be used for U.S. imperialist action across the Americas. For example, the Holy Roman Emperor was concurrently the King of Italy and the King of Germany across different century ranges, and the family members who sustained this empire under various noble titles were always looking to expand its reach, and with it the reach of Roman Catholicism across European states. In its later periods, one family in particular, the Habsburgs, had diversified enough through lineage and marriage that some of its members controlled Spain and Austria, among other European states. In the mid-1500s, Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I tried to take power from local Bohemian estates, essentially regional power brokers, an affluent class ranging in ethnic makeup who had traditionally negotiated amongst themselves with respect to state affairs. Ferdinand I disrupted their power by introducing Jesuit missionaries to spread Catholicism and limited the role of other estates in key matters such as selecting an heir to the local throne. And this worked for a bit, until yet another Ferdinand, Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II, not to be confused with Ferdinand II, Archduke of Austria. Believe me, European royalty really needed to diversify their naming traditions, governed this Roman Catholic Empire to a breaking point. In 1618, we had the delightfully named Defenestrations of Prague, a moment when two Catholic imperial counselors were tossed out a window, landing only a bit worse for wear on piles of manure 70 feet down by Protestant officials. This sparked a widespread revolt against the Holy Roman Empire's encroachment on regional politics and soon brought the whole region into armed conflict for decades. Is that messy enough for you? History generally is, but what matters for our purposes is thinking about different past relationships between the notion of an individual sovereign state and broader organizations exerting power over local affairs. At the end of this brutal conflict between the wide-ranging Bohemian estates and the Habsburgs and the whole concept of the Holy Roman Empire with all its monarchical Roman Catholic holdings across the continent, the territories we now know as Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Germany, Austria, and the Czech Republic began to work under a new theoretical framework for the nation state. In this story of humanity, which is to say the Western European one, ignoring all the other histories of nation states we get out of China, Africa, and Indo-America, the modern nation state came into being with the Peace of Westphalia. This set of bilateral treaties not only ended decades of active violence, but also introduced the idea that specific geographical territories contained their own national identities and as such had the right to self-governance without interference from religious imperial offices in foreign lands and with the ability to enter into alliances with other nation states without the permission of external power brokers. In other words, the Westphalian system that emerged from these treaties was predicated on the idea that a given nation had the right to political autonomy with respect to its internal affairs and its international partnerships. This was real sovereignty. Every king, every kingdom, every nation sharing in such a regional dominion with the right to its own local rule. And in the next century, eventually, this would also come to be interpreted as the right of the people to choose their own rulers, as in the American Revolution against British governance and the French Revolution against a disconnected monarchy. At least, that's the story two historians in particular, Leo Gross and Hans Morgenthau, created out of the fragile stuff of all our messy histories. On the 300th anniversary of the Peace of Westphalia, 
In the fragile post-war world of 1948, these two Jewish emigres from Austria and Germany would advance this story of the modern nation state in prominent political science journals, and with it, shape the mythology of international relations for at least the next 50 years without significant resistance to their main idea, namely that the peace of Westphalia marked a deep and sustained transformation to our political systems. Now, I won't get too deep into the academic pushback on this idea, except to say that it started in the 1990s, around when the humanities in general was undergoing a new historicist movement that involved revisiting a whole whack of accepted wisdom by reviewing original documents in a freshly critical light. And on the academic front, that work goes on. A whole other 30 years war of political science and international relations scholars producing articles grappling with the impact of Westphalian mythology on how we attempt to set limits on international power over sovereign enterprise, and vice versa. Links to the work of Stefan Bolak, Alexei Kubrianov, and Jonathan Mertz, along with a 2016 foreign affairs piece attempting to apply Westphalian ideals to the current Middle East, are all listed in the episode notes. But there's really no need to dive into the scholarship simply to recognize that what we're dealing with is a myth, or better said, the inevitably creative work of historians, which average students of history are often unfortunately taught to take as objective fact. Here are some easy counterfacts to the pat and simple story Westphalia tells us about political progress. The Holy Roman Empire continued until 1806, when it was dissolved during the Napoleonic Wars, which itself very clearly represented a failure of balance of power to sustain sovereign states from external influence. Then, in the 1870s, Russia struck a blow against the Ottoman Empire by taking control of land currently in Moldova and Ukraine. Back then, Austria-Hungary permitted this invasion in exchange for Russia's support of its own occupation of other Ottoman lands, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And although the two powers fell out of alliance for a bit, in 1907 an opportunity arose for Austria to gain Russian support for further encroachment into nearby territories. In 1908, Austria therefore annexed Bosnia, the country containing Sarajevo, and in one fell swoop, broke good faith relationships with many other European countries. Mind you, the head of Austria-Hungary's military hadn't helped with any of this balance of power nonsense, because Franz Conrad had been advocating for preemptive wars against Italy and Serbia for years out of anxiety about what their strengthening states might do if left to their own devices. But that, too, only furthers my point. Namely, the Westphalian notion of nation-states with clear sovereignty over internal affairs had never fully taken off in Europe and it most certainly hadn't been serving European nation states well long before Archduke Ferdinand's assassination set off a chain of events leading to World War I. Which leaves us with three important questions which the next episode will start to answer. First, if our Western notion of a discrete nation state has always been more mythologized history and abstracted ideal than anything resembling coherent state policy throughout European histories, what are the actual drivers of our current global paradigm? And if it turns out that the organizing principles shaping so much of human destiny are only loosely tethered to this notion of truly sovereign states, then why does the myth of the nation still have so much power over us? And lastly, if we could pull back the curtain on nationalist rhetoric, which has run the gamut from innocuous to insidious our entire lives, what might we do as a people, as a species, to challenge current systems of abuse of public power and seek to improve all the human lives they do not serve? Join me in episode two, how countries make themselves, as we explore some of the ways new nation-states come into being, and how even revolutions against old oppressive systems reveal the persistence of corporate organizing principles 
even in governments we'd love to believe are made of the people, for the people. This last is a beautiful idea, the sort of thing one might indeed be excited to pass on to the next generation. But in practice, in history, in all our interpretations of civilization's progress, it's one that's rarely had a chance to grow. This has been Global Humanist Shop Talk with M.L. Clark. Maurizio Ferraz is my one-man dream team of an audio production specialist. Studio space and resources were provided by Agencia El Grifo, and all further credits for cited and referenced content can be found in attached episode notes. All of this would not have been possible without my patrons, the vast majority of whom support me through Patreon. You can also follow my work at Better Worlds Theory, a weekly newsletter at mlclark.substack.com. None of us excels without the support of a community, and I am deeply thankful to have found mine. Be well, be kind, and seek justice where you can.